Hi everybody. I hope that you are all doing well and staying healthy in the midst of these unusual times. I am finding myself very thankful to be healthy, to be with family, and to be able to continue working. I have been transitioning to teaching online, which is a huge change. And on one hand, I'm really thankful for the technology that allows us to continue the learning process. But at the same time, I am really missing my students. I miss seeing them in person. And I feel for them and for all of the activities that they are missing out on right now. In the midst of all of this, a verse that I have continued to come back to is Psalm 1611, which says, you will fill me with joy in your presence. So that one has been um, helpful for me and I hope that maybe it can be a blessing to you too. Hi, this is Corey. I work for Landis' Supermarket in Percocy. I work in the meat department. And uh, working out in the public, sometimes you feel, I feel, a little nervous, scared, just because everybody come, is coming in. And, uh, but then I get the feeling, you get to hear them, hey, thank you. Thanks for all you're doing for us. We appreciate it. It makes you feel good inside. And I just try to get through the day and just stay safe. Hi, this is John and Kim Berge and Kate and Landon. We were asked just to share uh, something that we've uh, uh, found joy in and has kept us connected during this time. So we've been busy at home um, doing online learning for school. Kate and Landon have been busy doing that every day and I've been teaching my students virtually while John works in the basement for his job. And probably one of the things that has brought us the most joy is connecting with the MYF virtually. Uh, we have Bible study each week on Wednesday nights, and then we've been having um, Sunday school virtually using Zoom um, each week. And it's always so good to see the faces of um, the kids from the MIF and um, having our time of prayer and fellowship together. Hey gang, Luca came to visit us on his birthday. Ernie Haynes turns 89 today. Ernie Marie, what have you guys been doing during this uh, pandemic? What's life like? Well, I would say our life didn't change a whole lot because we've been retired for many, many years. And uh, uh, whatever whatever changed isn't really affecting us. I know it's uh, been tough on a lot of people, especially if they have a mortgage and the rent to pay and stuff like that. You know, we don't go for our groceries. Our daughter-in-law does that. And uh, other than that, we, we pretty much are enjoying life and staying home, just like I say. Yeah. Hurry, he's behaving himself, is that right? She says it's tough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Blooming Glen friends, this is Craig and Martha in our backyard on the top of South Mountain near Bethlehem. Craig's working from home, so we've had much more time together. We're enjoying the beauty of spring in our woods and working in our garden together. We've even managed to connect with family, friends, and neighbors at a distance, of course. We really miss hugging and playing with our grandkids. And we're waiting for the birth of a grandson in the next three to four weeks. Our daughter Kristen has done a terrific job of coping with all the work stress while working at home, COVID-19, being a mom, and then doing all of this while being really pregnant. Our daughter-in-law, Laura, works as an occupational therapist in a nursing home where there have been multiple deaths and many, many COVID-19 cases. She's stayed well, and she's a hero to all of us. We're looking forward to seeing our Blooming Glen friends when this all ends. God bless.
Greetings, Blooming Glen family and friends. We are so glad you've joined us for another week via technology. We gather today continuing to face uncertainty, anxiety, and fear as the world struggles with COVID-19. Deuteronomy 31.6 reminds us, be strong, be fearless, don't be afraid, and don't be scared by your enemies, because the Lord your God is the one who marches with you. He won't let you down, and he won't abandon you. As a representative of CLB, I would like to thank our pastors and staff for leading and feeding our congregation during these unparalleled times with words of care and wisdom, with creativity, with creative ideas, flexibility, and jumping into the digital world. And to each of you, our church family, thank you for your continued financial support. Continue to support each other. Remember to call the church staff to share any needs and use the many resources that the staff has provided for us on our website. Welcome to our time of worship. For our call to worship, I'd like to read from Luke 1, 78 to 79. Because of our God's great deep compassion, the dawn from heaven will break upon us to give light to those who are sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide us on the path of peace. Let's pray. Merciful God, we come together to worship longing for tenderness because this world can be hard. We come longing for light because our lives are crowded with shadows. We come desperately needing direction. Fill us with your peace. Your spirit is our peace and our path. Amen. Father.
be singing a new song by J.J. Heller that was written about this time. She wrote it, about, or she wrote it last week. It's called You Already Know. Now we'll sing Build My Life.
Let's come to God in prayer. Father, we thank you that we can come to you with our cares and worries. Remind us that we are not alone. Remind us that you care about this time in our life. Father, we thank you for standing with us and we receive your strength to stand another day. Thank you that we can trust you to rescue us. We pray for all who are affected by coronavirus through illness or isolation or anxiety. May they find relief and recovery. For those sick who are alone in hospitals and for their loved ones, God, draw near to them and by your mercy, let them encounter Christ, the friend who never leaves and never forsakes. For healthcare workers and first responders, God, reinforce their ranks and strengthen them with energy. For nursing homes, rehabilitation centers, and other long-term care facilities, God, encourage the lonely residents and strengthen the staff members who help them. Prevent further spread of infection and comfort families who can no longer visit their loved ones. For countries in the developing world, God, contain the spread of the infection in our world's most densely populated and poorest cities. Spare countries already burdened with disease and chronic poor health. For everyone anxious about the economic future, how they'll pay for housing, food, and essential medicines, God, connect them to sources to help through the church, government, and community, enable them to look towards you for provision. For people all over the world subjected to COVID-related racism, God, confront this evil with your swift justice and deliver our brothers and sisters from cruelty. For educators forced to adapt curriculum to online learning, for students forced to exercise more autonomy, and for the parents who need to assist, God, make homes a place of curiosity, inquiry, and study. For those disappointed by the cancellation of milestone celebrations like graduations, weddings, or baby showers, God, comfort them in their disappointments and make it possible for them to gather again with friends and family. For those involved with politics at every level, God, help our leaders to work collaboratively and communicate efficiently setting aside self-interest for the common good. For churches doing online discipleship, God bless our imperfect digital efforts and continue to advance the kingdom of Jesus through your people. We specifically lift up Michael, Mike, Jeff, Robin, Jen, Michelle, and Jen as they lead our church through these unprecedented times. God, inspire us in ways to show your love to one another, to ourselves and our neighbors. Guide our hearts and our actions to greater care, kindness, and generosity in the midst of these fears and uncertainties. Amen. doing hymn worship book 267 Christ has arisen
Thanks for joining us again for this virtual worship service. We're uh, recording this for Sunday, April 19th. It's the Sunday after Easter. And uh, if you're on our website, there is a button you can find to click and find a bulletin uh, that will show you who's involved. But just want to mention tonight, Joy Thomas is our worship leader. Matt and Emily Rittenhouse and their three daughters, along with Carrie Aldifer, are handling our singing tonight. And we're glad you've joined us. My name is Mike Ford, and along with Michael Bishop, I serve as one of the pastors here at Blooming Glen. And for those that are in our congregation, we uh, are continuing to look at ways that we might be able to um, try worship different ways. One of the things that we may try in a coming week or two is a Zoom worship service. We'll send out uh, information about that through email and Glen News as best we can. But uh, we want to try to continue to explore ways digitally that we can create fellowship uh, with people. So in the liturgical calendar again, this would be the first Sunday after Easter, where we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. Now at the time that Jesus died and rose again, the Christian world uh, back in Israel in those days was still in crisis and fear, even though they were just beginning. They were still struggling, um, but they had the hope of the resurrection. Jesus appeared over a period of 40 days after um, his, he first came back on Easter day, and so this was the time where they're starting to gain confidence that the truth is the truth, and he's telling them to go and spread it. And we are still in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, and so we still are in crisis and are struggling, and we still want to let the resurrection speak into that. I want to begin with a, a story that I'll leave you hanging a bit with. I played football through, uh, through my uh, grade school, high school, and then college days. In college, I played linebacker for Geniata College. And one of the unique things for me as I got to the college level was that I was one of the few Christians uh, and one of the only outspoken Christians on the football team. And many times that left me feeling alone. Um, and I was evaluated fairly by the coaches for my playing ability, but as far as the football team fellowship, uh, I didn't do drugs, I didn't sleep around, um, you know, I wasn't a drinker uh, or a partier in the way that those guys were. And so when it came time for the team to get together, I often was by myself. And at times the guys would make fun of me too for my convictions. Um, and that wore on me at times. I was ostracized or not accepted or even snubbed at times because of my faith. I just tell that story because we're going to talk a bit tonight about trials in our faith and what that can mean in our lives. Join me in prayer. Lord God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. We pray by your Holy Spirit that you would help us all to be good listeners to what your word might say to us and then good appliers as we live out our salvation as followers of Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. So in a, a minute or two, Joy is going to read for you the scripture that we're looking at tonight. If you want to turn to it uh, with your Bible at home, we're looking at 1 Peter, first chapter, and the verses we'll concentrate on tonight are verses 3 through 9. But let me just summarize a bit about the context again to set the stage for you. So in this verse, we're dealing with Peter. And although we don't know it as a fact, our impression of Peter through scripture is that he's kind of a hot-headed guy. He's impulsive, um, he's hasty. Uh, that's our guess a bit about his personality, and that's often how you see him portrayed in movies about uh, that time. I identify with that. I like Peter's style. He jumps right in. Uh, he's spontaneous. He tries everything. When he sees Jesus walking on the water, he says, can I come to you? Can I do that too? When he first tries to refuse Jesus washing his feet, and Jesus says, nope, you need to do this, he says, okay, not only my feet, but all of me. Um, and he's one of the first people to see, to go to the, the empty tomb and then to begin to tell the message of the resurrected Messiah. What we do know about him factually is that he was a fisherman by trade, that Jesus called him from that trade to be a disciple. He was a leader amongst the original 12. He also then denied Jesus uh, at the time of his crucifixion. And then three days later again, when confronted with Jesus, who was resurrected, Jesus restored him to right fellowship. So he, he went through a lot with Jesus, and then he became a leader in the growing church. And that's where we find this story today. Uh, 
Biblical scholars think this was written in about 60 to 65 AD. And, um, and in fact, Peter dealt a lot with Rome too. In fact, that was a very important city for his teaching. Roman Catholics that followed Christ, in fact, saw Peter's influence as so significant that Rome remained a huge part of the Roman Catholic tradition and their practice of faith. So we're meeting Peter again, who's an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle means he's one of the original messengers. He had been a personal representative, or think of him as an ambassador for Christ. He had been with Jesus in life. He'd seen Jesus die. He saw Jesus rise again. And the resurrection had a deep impact on Peter and what he did for the growing church. I want to show you a map here of the area that we're in here. In the first two verses of 1 Peter 1, we read about uh, a geographic region. Um, there are five regions mentioned, but it's better to think of this as Asia Minor or modern day Turkey. What had happened is that the Jews came to know Christ first, that went on to the Gentiles, they became Christians, and then the Gentiles moved up into uh, the areas of Galatia and Byrhythmia and Cappadocia and all over what's again present day Turkey. And Peter's writing to the people that were up, up here. It was a great diaspora or a migration of early Christians up into these areas. And it's not just a geographic migration, it is a cultural and social migration too. These folks moved into new areas and they were the minority, not only for their faith, but minority in terms of cultural practice. Um, many of them were probably slaves or marginalized people in that culture. And so Peter's writing to these Gentile Christians to say, no matter how hard it is, embrace your identity as Christ's followers. He's speaking to an audience that he wants to remain faithful to Jesus in the midst of hard times, in the midst of pressures to conform to different social and cultural norms. The context is important so that we know, again, the original story, but also because these are our spiritual ancestors. In this congregation, and, and most Christians I know are Gentiles, um, not Jewish Christians, but non-Jewish Christians. And these are some of the first non-Jewish Christians that are learning how to live out the Christian life. They were also some of the first evangelists. And so we are part of the family that that, that word spread from and eventually made its way into North America for most of us. The context also gives us a, a record of God's early dealing with the church and an example for things that we need to think about now. We're one family with these folks and the principles that God is giving in this scripture, we can apply them in our context and our time as well. Our faith struggle is now. Where Peter's letter might be most meaningful today, in my opinion, would be to Christians in a persecuted country or Christians trying to live out their faith in a country that's predominantly a non-Christian religion. Or I thought, too, uh, of students going to a college campus, especially one where they are the minority as a Christian, a place where they're trying to walk out faith, where the atmosphere not be as conducive to them as their previous setting. Anywhere that we're living out the gospel, where there's ad adversity, where there's challenge, where there's trial, that's the kind of context we're talking about here. And yes, I think we can apply it to the pandemic today. This is a time, not that we're being persecuted for our faith, but where there's challenge to our faith, where there's opposition, where there's things that cause us to figure out how to handle our faith in new ways. So Peter's advice in all this is to hang in there, Christians. Keep acting in a Christian manner. Your identity is with Jesus. Live it out. If you would listen, I'm going to ask Joy to read verses 3 through 9 now, and then I'll explain more of this scripture. 1 Peter 1, 3 to 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials. 
so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Thank you. If you look at the structure of that in the Bible, it's basically a, a 10 sentence run on that begins with praising God, that reminds us that our salvation brings joy and that can, it can sustain us during suffering. And it gives us perspective. It's pretty much saying Christians, no matter how bad it gets, remember, you have salvation. So what is salvation? We know, especially as you've just celebrated Easter, that salvation means we're saved from the power of sin. Sin doesn't have a hold on us. We can repent from sin and get a clean slate and be forgiven. We know that salvation means we're saved from the power of death. That when we die as Christians, we know that we have eternal life with God. But it's much more than that. Salvation in the context of this verse tonight also means living out your faith. Philippians 2.12 puts it well, that we have to work out our salvation. What salvation means is to keep on working to completion the maturing of your faith. So think of it in that context as, you, as we look at this scripture. In verse 3, we're reminded right away that we have a new birth into this living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Christians were reminded that we're set aside for a new life. We're to be different. The old is gone, and our basic identity is based upon following Jesus in the world. I want to make an analogy to an old car. This happens to be, I think, a 66 Chevelle, for those of you that are car fans. But maybe this analogy will help you in terms of what I'm trying to say in the scripture. Imagine you're an old car. You need some work. You still might work, but you need some work done on you to get into good shape. And no one's changed the oil for a while. Spark plugs are bad. Your wires are bad. You've got rust. You've got bald tires. Well, if you're this car, you've got more problems than I can name. But then you become, if you will, a Christian. You can't stay the old you. Everything changes. In the new, and this is the actual same car fully restored, Jesus refreshes everything. You've got everything new in your life. New oil, new plugs, new wires, new tires. You are radically different. You need to maintain yourself now. You need to stay different. You just can't doing the same, you can't just keep doing the same old things. You're a new creation now, and people should notice the change. We're changing into an inheritance that is imperishable, that's undefiled, that's unfading. Put another way, we are now a signpost for the world that says something new. Through the resurrection, God has put his spirit in us, and now people see by the way we live who Jesus is. So when you take an old car and you put time and money into it to resurrect it, if you will, to make it new, you expect it to come out changed. You expect things to be different. It's going to work better. It's going to have power. It's going to have new purpose. And so if the same is true in our Christian life, people should be able to ask or look at us and say, what's different about you because you're a Christian? So in coming to Jesus, in, in having experienced resurrection power, that means we've chosen to change something about us our perspectives, our motives, our morals, the way we behave, the way we treat people, it's new. We've inherited a newness through the life that Jesus gives us, and that life reveals to others that we follow Jesus. Now, the metaphor to a new car, it's a limited tran transformation or a limited metaphor. I mean, for some people, their coming to Christ is a dramatic turnaround. They were this, and they became something radically different. For most Christians in this church, our Christian, we've had exposure to Christianity most of our lives and have grown up with a good nurture. And there wasn't this one-time black-to-white kind of turnaround. There was this gradual growth into maturity. 
But from the time anyone decides to follow Jesus, the question we need to ask ourselves is, am I living a transformed life? Is there something new and different about me? Do I earnestly try to live out the gospel? I chose to follow Jesus over 40 years ago, and it was a dynamic change in my life. But it's still a transformation. I'm still figuring out how to do it better and better. So it's a lifelong thing, and that's what working out our salvation means. And that's the invitation of Jesus, especially at this time of Easter, as we experience the resurrection. We're saved, and we believe, or we're saved from sin and death, but we have to keep working it out. Will it be easy? No. In verse 6, Peter tells his audience, and us in turn, that you can rejoice in this salvation, but you're going to have to suffer various trials. Now, again, these early Christians, they were a social and cultural minority. These folks were, some of them were homeless. They were considered aliens up in Asia Minor. Uh, some of them were slaves, and they were persecuted and oppressed by the majority culture around them. What's our suffering? Well, right now we are struggling with the pandemic that's worldwide. How are Christians behaving in the midst of this crisis? How do we behave as we suffer? Do we complain? Grumble? I've done some of that. Or are we letting this crisis form in us godly qualities like patience and kindness and thoughtfulness and generosity and sacrifice? Are we thinking just about myself and what I want to get through? Or are we reaching out? Are we thinking of others? Are we praying more for people? Are we blessing our neighborhood? We all suffer. We all face difficulty. It's part of life. It's part of being a Christian. What Peter's telling us here is it will come. Lean into it. Don't avoid it because our faith matures as we suffer. In verse 7, he says, so that the genuineness of your faith is tested and refined, and Jesus is revealed through it. I started this uh, sermon talking about my time in in college when I felt ostracized for being a Christian uh, on a team that was primarily non-Christians. And again, my suffering wasn't nearly what, like these early Christians, suffered. But... In time, it really helped me to grow and learn to know how to go against the flow. It taught me how to be myself and stand firm for my convictions. It taught me how to not submit to peer pressure. There was a refining in it. And in fact, the longer I kept my convictions and became friends with the guys, through the years, there there came much more respect and discussions about faith, too. So the metaphor that Peter uses is of gold. And I've got two pictures here of gold ore, not not pure gold or nuggets, but often gold is found mixed in with other rock. And the metaphor is of refining. And so refining with flame is one of the oldest methods of refining metals. So in ancient times, this form of refining would have involved a craftsman sitting next to a hot fire, pounding rock into little pieces, and then melting it or molting it into a crucible, and then the impurities would typically bubble up to the top. And they would skim off the impurities and keep skimming and heating and skimming and heating until they had molten gold. In modern gold refining, there are at least 10 steps and likely more of grinding, reducing, heating, chemical treatment, filtering, produce, that will produce a little bit of pure gold. So as we get to the refining part, you're in the crucible, it's hot. It's not comfortable. You know, the metaphor for it is going to mean that you're going to be in the fire sometimes for a while. And that's what the trial is going to feel like. But what Peter's talking about is hang in there. The suffering, the refining can be long and hard, but maturity comes from it. Growth comes from it. Christian growth comes from it. So why have hope in the midst of all this? Why have faith in Jesus in the midst of trials? Well, we have faith because we believe he is faithful. 
But when we love Christ and follow him in the midst of hard times, we can rejoice in knowing that there is growth and maturity. We may not see it immediately, but when we hang in there and trust in Jesus, character can be built. And that's, again, what working out your salvation means. It means that the hard work of being a Christian will help you grow in faith. Difficult things should be faced and endured and worked through. Love and follow Jesus through thick and thin. Salvation, which is again this growing towards completeness in Christ, it's a long, hard, lifelong journey. It's a constant refining. And so we look at this verse tonight and we can have hope in the midst of it. And so just like this current crisis feels like it's going to last a lot longer than we'd prefer, let's look to develop in it. Let's look to to grow. Let's look to be an influence. Now again, we need to admit that what we face in, in our area, in North America as Christians, is not nearly what the early Christians faced that Peter was talking to. We in North America live in a, a society that's much more tolerant and inclusive of different faith traditions than they were in Peter's time. We suffer very little comparatively because of our faith. We're not persecuted because we're Christians. And yet, we can all cut our life and we all have challenges. We're all gonna have something that uh, we struggle with or suffer for. So let's challenge ourselves with this question. How bold or how courageous am I in living out my faith when it's hard and taking a stand for my convictions when I'm in the minority, in going against the majority flow or against a cultural norm because I don't think it honors God? When we do that, we can expect pushback and grief and some suffering. But in closing, remember this. When you suffer, when you're picked on for your faith, when you feel alone as a follower of Jesus, Christians long before you, centuries before you, have experienced the same thing. And as long as Jesus tarries, Christians after us will experience the same thing. So hang in there, followers of Jesus. Let's let the challenges help us grow, that we influence our world with our faith in Jesus. Let's have hope in knowing that Jesus always offers redemption, always loves us, always forgives us, is not even now preparing a heavenly home for us. And while we're on this earth, we can lean into our trials and allow ourselves to be refined and matured through them. I want to close with a poem from Wise Kentucky poet Wendell Berry. This comes from his collected poems, and it's entitled The Real Work. It may be that when we no longer know what to do, we have come to our real work. And that when we no longer know which way to go, we have come to our real journey. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. The impeded stream is the one that sings. Amen. Please take out your Sing the Journey book and turn to number 109. There is more love somewhere.
Thank you for being with us. Peace and joy to you. And in the midst of any suffering or trial that you have, remember that Jesus is with you in it. Lean into it. Good things can come. Amen.